Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. I, <laughs> I'm already off script, so there you have it. I was looking at this beautiful picture of myself off video. And if you are on social media, last weekend, people were doing the 10-year challenge, like where you were in 20, I guess, 2012 and where you are in 2022. And then some people were saying where it started and where it's, where it, where it's, where, where it started and where it is. So this picture here is where it started March, 2020, when we were all on Zoom. <laughs> This picture here is how it's going. So <laughs> there you have it. I had my hair all tight in a tight bun, had on this beautiful dress. Don't have it in the bun, but we're all here. So I am very, very excited to have you with me today. Um, and really, truly, I, I was telling Karen, with this being the first one of the new year, I was just wondering how many people would be joining us and there's 28 on and more coming. So we're gonna get, jump right in. Wanna let you know you are in the right place. This is observation and assessment. And I would venture to say, we know we are teaching whatever the format, whether you have been um, a hybrid, a face-to-face -face and remote, whether you've been fully remote, whether you've been fully face-to-face, -face, and of course now um, having to make even more adjustments. One thing we know is that educators are showing up and teaching is happening. We do also wanna know, are the students learning? That hard work of teaching, are the students getting the benefit of that that we hope for them to be getting? This is sponsored by Early Childhood Professional Learning. And this whole series, for those of you that have been with us uh, since actually September, this entire series is in support of the Pre-2K Collaboration Project, which was inspired by the KTAC report. It's actually the Kindergarten Transition Advisory Committee report. It came out, as you can see, back in September 2018. And this report was just actually put out in response to the Illinois legislative body saying, why are we still having problems when children transition from early childhood education and care to kindergarten? So this report came out. It gave specific ideas for legislative levers, they called them, and then specific ideas for just practice, things that we could kind of get our microscopic lens out and see, are we doing them well in Illinois? And from, from that report, Cindy Berry, who is the project director for ECPL, has been teaming with the Kindergarten Individual Development Survey, professional learning coordinator, and really bringing together pre-K and K to not only talk about what transitions look like, but to try to put systems in place that help us be able to have evidence-based practices for all of our colleagues, which is for all of our children and families. I am your host for this evening. I'm Dr. Antoinette Taylor. A little bit of information about myself right in front of you. You see that DEC positions paper. I am so excited about this paper. I was actually on the planning team and the national writing team. The paper is out, it's ready to go. And you will find out February 2nd and March 2nd as we end up this whole series, we ended up on MTSS. And, and we've been waiting with bated breath. The, the actual MTSS paper was finished a while back, but of course the pandemic just kind of 
pressed pause on getting it finalized and edited and ready for public consumption, but it is out now. As I said, I was a part of the planning team, getting the gearing up ready for that paper and the, and the national writing team. So I'm so excited that when we talk about MTSS, we will have this new document that is specific for early childhood, and it'll be a part of the conversation on February 2nd. At from 4 to 5.30, and then on March 2nd, we'll wrap it all up after we define MTSS and place all of these pieces that we've been working on into that what that definition is. Then we'll talk about creating and implementing. So that's February 2nd and March 2nd. The Kindergarten and Tr Transition Advisory Committee report broke itself out into three themes. And here are the themes. When it comes to transitioning students from pre early childhood education and care to kindergarten, and, and if we're honest, for us with early childhood, our spectrum is birth to age eight, we could easily say from EI to pre early childhood education and care to kindergarten, and then we could say from kindergarten to third grade, there was these themes that the KTAC report put their findings. Aligned teaching and learning, aligned assessments and data. And then my favorite, favorite one is strengthening cross-sector partnerships. Partnerships with community-based organizations, childcare, Head Start, charter, private, uh, the community at large, faith-based. How can we strengthen those partnerships? And in some places, it's really start them. Because if there are in some places where we know that these partnerships really haven't begun, so you almost could ca call that start and strengthen cross-sector partnerships. And when we look at these two words, align, align doesn't mean they have to be the same. We know that from developmentally appropriate practices. But we do want to be able to at least have some type of crosswalk of the work that we're doing so that it makes it easier for families when they, as children, go from one place to the next. It makes it easier for us to seek and share wisdom from each other across grade levels. And it certainly makes it easier to have a full, seamless package for children. This series is the foundation of teaching and learning. And one thing that we know about education is good intentions are not enough. There is literally some assembly required. When we take the standards and we take the evidence-based practices and initiative after initiative after another initiative and reform after reform, we're constantly assembling our teaching and learning practices so that we can truly implement to fidelity what it is we want our children to have. Housekeeping, we're gonna go straight through tonight. Gonna to try to give you back, instead of taking a break in the middle, we'll give you that time back on the end. So we're all adults. If you need to get up, stretch your legs, go get some tea, some hot chocolate. Uh, I'm a big Downton Abbey fan, a biscuit, which is, I think is just a cookie if you're over in the UK. Feel free to get up and do that and then come right on back. And then we're gonna show ourselves some grammar grace. We are not gonna be doing breakout sessions. We're gonna do everything in the room today. So you'll be doing a lot of chatting. And then ultimately, I, I hope that you will be willing to come off of mute and share because as we go into the chat, I, as, as I see things, We'll want to have conversations about it. And so please, please feel free if I call your name out, just if you're if you're free, if you're okay with it, if you're comfortable enough, come off mute and be willing to share because I am your facilitator today. But really and truly, we are all seeking and learning wisdom from each other because the truth is no one, none of us are the COVID-19, what this looks like, variant, Da 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 experts in doing this work. None of us have lived through it. So we're all experts together. 
And so now I've shared you a little bit of information about myself, got the housekeeping out of the way. Yes, I am an Adele fan. Yes, she does have a new CD out, which I love. But one of my favorite songs of hers is Hello. And so now that you've known a little bit about me, of course, the next thing is for me to ask you to tell me a little bit about yourself. So go ahead in the chat. And just say, let me know if you're an administrator, consultant, if you are a teacher, are you a pre-K teacher, kindergarten or other? And I'm just really excited to know that um, we have had some teams on these uh, professional learning opportunities. So we've had some kindergarten and pre-K teachers, uh, even some first, second, third grade teachers. So if you are a teacher, what grade level, teacher assistants, whoo, whoo, paraprofessionals in the house, family specialist, if you are a family member, parent or guardian, instructional leader or coach or other, go ahead and put that in the chat. Oh, Kim, see, look at that. Oh my gosh. Kat let's see, Kat Katrina Larson, toddler teacher. And I saw someone else said they're in a toddler room. Kim Mendel. So already I am loving that with, with you all mine coming off mute and sharing. So, so that toddler, I am assuming that that's that birth to, to two, two and a half is range. Uh, yes, I'm Katrina, and um, my toddler classroom, they have to be 24 months when they come into my classroom in September, and then, um, so I have some that turn three, you know, that have missed the preschool cutoff, so it's a combination of anywhere from 24 months to, um, they can be, you know, three and a half by the time they leave my room. Okay, love that. Thank you so much. And then Kim, I think I saw another person that said preschool teacher, toddlers, Kim Men Mendel. I hope I said that right. Yes, I, I just wrote on there. I have two-year-olds that turn three during the school year. Okay. So already we're thinking about the standards, right? And in our, our state, the Illinois Early Learning Guidelines are birth to age 36 months. And the Illinois Early Learning and Development Standards are three through kindergarten enrollment. And we're gonna talk about them a little bit more uh, later, later on. And the new Illinois Learning Standards for kindergarten start at kindergarten through the end of kindergarten. So already we see that connection between er, Illinois Early Learning, birth to 36 months, which is three, 36 months is three year old, but then we see that overlap even of the guidelines of the standards of birth to 36 months. And then the Illinois Early Learning Standards, three years old to kindergarten enrollment. And then the new Illinois Learning Standards for kindergarten are kindergarten through the, the last day of when the child is actually with you in kindergarten. So I, I'm so excited to have our toddler teachers welcome. I feel like that's kind of a first. Um, that we have some some EI toddler folks with us like that. Um, I see some special ed. I don't pick favorites, but I kind of do. Woo -woo, special ed in the house, special ed rocks. So those blended classrooms, so important because when you're talking about observing and assessing children, we need to do that with the knowledge, not only of development of children, but of functional expectations, chronological expectations of our children. And, and we all know, and this is very, very true, there's no such thing, uh, even with the kindergarten individual development survey, you would be surprised how very strict the guidelines are for that in KIDS around children with disabilities. There's no blanket. Oh, if the child is a kindergarten, has an IEP or the 504 plan, we don't need to do this survey to find out their readiness to learn. It still must be done. So we, it's very important that we understand the special education process and students 
who are have a disability, students who are multilingual learners, students who fall up under that special populations process when we observe and, and assess. Uh, teacher assistants, yes, that is where I started out. Okay, I'm dating myself, that's okay, we're all family here. I actually started this work when um, it was called Title 20 daycare that's how long ago i've been in the business and in title 20 i started out as a classroom assistant and and what we know is that the adults in the classroom make up the support system and if you've ever looked at eckers 3 eckers 3 went so far as to to say staff they don't differentiate teacher from classroom assistant they say staff is any adult that is regularly involved with children. And so it is so important that these offerings and that communication between teacher and classroom assistant, um, paraprofessional is there and it's ongoing. We got a music teacher with us today. Yay, Donna, I love that. My niece is actually wants to do musical therapy uh, when she graduates in two years. Love this. We have a very nice group with us today. If I didn't catch, try to make sure I catch everyone. And I do believe we have some administrators as well. Bob, you know how that is. As the saying goes, every time we think we're out, what happens? They pull us back in. So yeah, and, and God knows we certainly, with, with teaching shortages right now, um, we kind of need all hands on deck. Thank you all so much for sharing. And then um, our next thing you're going to put in the chat for me is where are you based? Are you are you a CBO, community-based organization, preschool for all, preschool for all expansion, Head Start, home-based? Again, if you are a kindergarten, are you in a district, charter, private, or others? And you all, we've had so many... We actually, I think our last one, we had someone on with us who this, their, the child care facility is located within a senior citizen facility. And what they are finding is that the children benefit from having that elder kind of energy and the elder energy is impacted by having those young children there. So we've had some very, very interesting locale locations. So I'm excited to see what we have here. Preschool for all in a district setting. Corey, okay, University Lab, which one would you mind sharing, Corey? Look at all these okay. prizes. Hey there. Um, so yes, yeah, so I think I had mentioned I, I was on one of the first webinars a, a few months ago with you, but at the ISU Child Care Center, and I think you met my co-teacher Kayla last time. Yes, yes, <laughs> she knows my daughter Angelica. That's why I was yes. kind of asking you to <laughs> yeah. pull that out. Absolutely. Yeah. So our, our university lab programs. Thank you again for sharing, Corey. I see Absolutely. so many private private preschool. This is just so exciting. And I've said this before, uh, Head Start. I see Edith Luna is from Head Start. I kind of feel like the romper room lady, you know, I've got my little, you want to try to mention every single name, which you can't. So, you know, thank you. If I don't happen to mention your name, it doesn't mean that I don't see it. Um, but I, I think it's important. And, and if you've been on with me before, you, you know that I'm a, I'm a proponent of inclusivity, right? Charter programs have young children in them. Private preschools, the archdiocese, we all, these are all of our children. And so the, as great a collegial net that we can spread, it will only benefit our children and our families and then the community more and more and more. So I'm just so excited to see um, that we do have some charter programs with us. And so Ms. Edgehill, would you mind sharing what charter network or school you are with? And then I'm gonna ask Cla Claudia, Claudia, if I'm saying that right, Claudia, if you would share PLCCA education coordinator. I am with, Elaine Locke Charter School. 
in Chicago. Yes. Yes. Welcome, welcome, welcome. And Claude, Cl Cl Claudia Dragos. And if I'm saying your name wrong, feel free to cor cor correct me. So we'll come back to Claudia. Maybe you can share. We'll be willing to share a little bit later then. And then I see a lot of public school districts as well. Thank you all so, so much for sharing. And, and we will have to definitely go back. The Illinois AEYC is they, they are the um, subdivision of the National Association for the Education of Young Children. And they have been working with ECPL to get the word out more to community-based programs. And, and we found this out shortly after the pandemic when ECPL was doing a lot of webinars because we were all obviously disconnected and trying to feel our way through, the few people that would be on these webinars that were community-based, the main thing they were saying is, no one is communicating with us. We are reaching out to public school districts. We have children aging out. No one is communicating with us. We kind of feel like we're out in no man's land. And so Cindy Berry has been really making a concerted effort to make sure that these webinars, they are free to all and they are high quality, really get out to everyone. And so this year we did something different and she partnered with Illinois AEYC and then they've been getting the word out about it too. And so it's just very, very heartening to see this nice group of mix that we have. although. Um, the work that we're doing, the settings may be different. I think our goal is the same and that is to help children and families. And so now before we get started, I feel like I would be remiss if I didn't do a quick multiple choice question. Please wait until you see all of the answers. Could we even have imagined that in January, 2022, this would still be at the forefront of all of our thinkings. We finally got over what stage are we in? And now we have to figure out what variant we're dealing with. Is it remote learning? Is it hybrid learning? Are we gonna be in class, out of class? What are the guidelines? Oh, nope, they just changed it. So my question as Joey would say, how you doing? Is it A, B, C, D, I have to say, this is kind of my favorite one, E, or all of the above. Put your letter in the chat. Yeah, because you know what you are. Hey, Denise Wood, I thought I saw your name there. This is a lot. This is a lot. It's a lot professionally. It's a lot personally. And I, I just felt like, let's not play pretend. We are going to get to the information that we have today. It's good information. But I just wanted to take the moment to ask the question, validate the answer, and also let us see we're not by ourselves. So if you've been feeling like that, I don't even know which emotion to have. I start out the day feeling like, yes, I got this. And then by the middle of the day, something else has happened or another guideline has come out. And then I'm, I'm like, forget the whole thing. I'm feeling sick of all of this. It's making me feel loopy. Look at the responses in the chat. F, F, D, 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 we, it, it feels isolated, but we really are collectively kind of going through this together. And I just wanted to take a moment, acknowledge that. And then again, say to you, it makes me deeply, deeply appreciative of the time that you're taking after going through these days where we're feeling all of the above to then come on and spend your time with us this evening. And so now that we've done that, 
What are your thoughts? Let me know why you joined today. You can go ahead and put that in the chat. And then we're gonna jump right in. Lots of questions up front, then we kind of jump in, then we sprinkle some more chats in, in the middle. So go ahead and share in the chat your thoughts. Like when you saw this and you thought, I, I do wanna do that one. What do you hope to take away from our time together today? And you can put that in the chat. Yep, Denise, you've been so faithful, Denise. So, so faithful. And I, I, you've been so faithful and consistent. So I, I'm hoping that it's, as Dr. Phil would say, how's that working for you? I hope it's going good. Yeah, Sandy, we, we can all kind of figure this out a little bit more. Beth, thank you for saying that. How to support the staff. Family, family, family. Remember that word because there's going to be something a little bit later on. I'm going to say, I'm going to actually ask you, did I miss anything? Hint, hint. I'm giving you the answer to the quiz before we take it. Family. Uh, Bob is saying, I always did a bunch of assessment and found it super helpful. Yes. Yeah, what has changed? That's such a good question, Bob. Um, it's almost like what has changed and what has not changed. Yikes, right? Okay, Linda, how do you assess and observe when you go virtual, right? Because of the portfolio and checkpoints. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Kim, as you are in a new leadership role, Love that authentic, how to better facilitate authentic observation. And you also want to be able to help the teachers in your care. You know what, Kim? You must, did you see my PowerPoint before we actually did it? Assessment doesn't have to be scary. And there's a reason why it is. And we'll address that a little bit, um, a little bit later on, but assessment does not have to be scary. It's a beautiful way to spotlight growth. It's a beautiful way to highlight areas of need, but there's no reason at all for it to be scary. And, and it's certainly, there is a reason for that. As I said, we'll talk about that. It is important to, to families and administrators. Donna, that same reason for that scary that I just talked about is the same reason why it, it we're family members we know because they want to know that their children are going to be ready for kindergarten. Most families are very, very concerned, like, is my child going to be ready for kindergarten? Is my child going to be reading? Is my child going to be doing that? So, so we kind of understand it from families, but administrators, there's that, why is this, you know, like this? It's really the same reason. This, the reason that it's scary for educators is that same answer for that. Why is it so you know, do administrators put so much emphasis on, on assessment? Ways in which to be present, be a present teacher that sees, oh, Corey, sees where the room is at as a whole to improve learning that makes it meaningful for everyone. And I would say including in that everyone is us. It, you sh it is okay for you to be included in the positive, sustainable outcomes that happen in your classroom because it, you you are the head, right? You're you you not the sage on the stage, but you are the one. You set the temperature, you set the energy. So it is important that those sustainable outcomes are also what you recognize yourself. And then, of course, how do we communicate this to families? So 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 important. Yes, Sheila, um, because oftentimes what Sheila is saying, everyone, is sometimes it's difficult to meet the requirements of the district and remain faithful to developmentally appropriate learning and assessment. 
it's helpful to be with like-minded people, which we, as, as Wendy Williams would say, you are my people, right? We are all are each other's people. A and we've already done the developmentally appropriate practice webinar. That was earlier on in the series, but before we get off today, I'll make sure that I put that, uh, the new NAEYC guidelines on DAP, they go from birth to third grade. I will put that link in, in the chat because I don't think it's on the resource page so that you all can have it. It's really, really good. And it helps us realize how to remain faithful because the truth is this is not true for all administrators. But the truth is, we do have some administrators who are voluntold, this year, you're going to be the birth to third grade coordinator. You're going to be the principal in the early learning academy building. But all of their knowledge is middle school and high school. And we have not learned the dual language of speaking early childhood education and care to school age, middle school, high school. So when you have administrators that are bringing to you what their knowledge base is, they approach assessment for, early, for young children the same way we approach evaluation for higher students. And it can be frustrating. It can be frustrating and it, and, and it brings in that scary piece. So, so again, this is not all, but many administrators, uh, once you get that type, you get that certificate or that where you can be an administrator, your, your superintendent of a district can pretty much kind of put you anywhere and you may not have that solid base of early childhood education. So I'm, I'm admiring all of our administrators that are on today, especially our newer ones. Okay, everybody, let's jump in. Thank you all so much for sharing. So I think from looking at your, your feedback, here's what our essential questions are. What's the purpose of observation? How does one observe appropriately? What does it mean to assess? And how does one know what to assess? So these are the questions we're gonna to try to answer today. So earlier on in the chat, you were saying, some of you were saying, I want them to be able to do authentic observation, authentic assessment. So let's start by asking ourselves and sharing out, what do you think authentic observation is? authentic assessment. If you were an administrator, if you are an administrator with us tonight and you were going to define this or talk about this to your staff, how would you talk about authentic observation, authentic assessment? How would you define it? For those who are teachers, classroom assistants, how would you define it to families? When you're talking about doing observations, how would you define it to them? And it's certainly okay to say, I like I don't like I know it up here, but say articulating it is different. Observing and assessing during what goes on in the classroom every day, documenting all oh, what you truly see and not sugarcoating the situation. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, did I look at this and I saw something different because this student is my boo, woo, right? Everybody loves boo. And the other side of that, if we took out the sugar coating, we could put <laughs> spice coating, right? This student who isn't my boo, maybe gives me that atypical challenging behavior that, that is uncomfortable for me. I observe this child and no matter what it is, I've got in my mind, the challenging behavior that, that um, I experience when this child is in duress and that colors everything I'm observing. That colors, colors all of my documentation. So that sugar coating, it can be sugar coating or throwing a little bit of spice on there as well. 
Rosa, yes, that's how we take some ways that we do take notes, pictures, videos. Uh, Heather, whoop, whoop. That's called on demand. Come over here. Come over here, John Doe. What letter is this? A. Okay, good. What color is this? B. Okay. Oh, blue. Yes. Okay. Is this, what is this? Okay. A, B pattern. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's called on demand testing. And while on demand testing has its place in education, when it comes to early childhood, and, and I would dare say all the way up to kindergarten, hence the kindergarten individual development survey is authentic observation and assessment of children during their naturalistic learning activities. It is not here, come take this test. I need to know what you can do and make a decision about it. What truly documenting what the child does in the classroom. And we'll talk about that a little bit more at Azuk. Azuxina, I hope I pronounced that right. If I didn't, let me know. And then um, BH, benchmarking. Yes, we are going to talk about that. Beth, we're going to talk about benchmarking. And that's almost going to be a great segue into uh, what we're going to do next. Thank you all so much for sharing. So why do we observe? Look at all of these reasons. And safety needs to be the priority. And that teaching strategies is not teaching strategies as in creative curriculum. That teaching strategies is us, our strategies, our techniques, our practices. So look at all of these reasons that we have for observing. What about the safety of children? Communicating with children. Guidance for them, guidance for us. Remember the second part of our, our title? We know we're teaching. Are they learning? Measure their progress. And if we don't see measurable progress, that's okay. Let's do some self-reflection. What have we done? Why did we do it? When did we do it? How did we do it? Do we need to do anything different? All of these reasons, discovering the interest of the children. And it is certainly, a, yes, we have a curriculum. Yes, we have the standards. Yes, as, as we saw in, in the chat. Yes, but our administrators are wanting us to do so many things that are not developmentally appropriate. What is the interest of the children? That's the inroad that lets the children know we care about you. It's not just about hurry up, you gotta learn how to do this. What interests you? What's their style of, of learning? All of these reasons contribute to why we observe. I wanna talk a little bit more about that accountability because that's kind of like the, oh, we hate that word. And, and rightfully so, because when accountability is not implemented properly, and I'm just gonna go ahead and say it from the state level to the district level, to the, to the building level, accountability, almost seems like accuse, 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 but it's not. This is what accountability is, means. And we should be able to show evidence across all domains of children's learning. And at least understand if we don't see the evidence of that learning, dive deep enough to figure out why. Framework for recording each child's interest. Learning, 
is an interactive process. So we're learning from the children, the children are learning from us, the children are learning from each other, the children are learning from the classroom assistants, the paraprofessionals. I'm learning from the paraprofessional, I'm learning from the family. It's, it is literally a cyclical partnership. So accountability does not have to be that little bad word. It literally is, let's make an account for what we're doing. Some things are easier to observe than others. Physical development, language, speech, cognitive and social emotional, not so much. When it comes to data that you collect, we want to work smarter, not harder. One good piece, and the operative word there is good, can be used for multiple measures and on multiple children. This is even true for remote learning. So whether you're on a Google platform, uh, a virtual platform, Zoom, whatever it is, Think about the piece of evidence that you want to see. And we're gonna talk about this in just a few seconds, but thinking about what is it that I'm trying to answer? Because really observing, you're trying to answer a question. And yes, that question is, I know I'm teaching, that's the statement. Are the students learning? That's the question. You then put on, are the students learning what? You, you finish that off. Are the students learning a behavior, a skill, or knowledge? Knowing that up front, whether you are face-to-face, -face, whether you are virtual, you are heightening your awareness to kind of hear it, see it, experience it. That could be whole group. It can be small group. It can be individual. And that individual does not mean you've turned it into a taking a test on demand. It is true that for some of our students, especially when, when, when you're kind of on that borderline, like I, I really, like sometimes I see John Doe or Jane Doe do this. And then sometimes it seems like they don't. That's the student you want to get up a little bit close and personal with and do a little bit more observing so that you can make a true decision that is what valid and reliable. And to do all of this, we don't have to work ourselves into a frenzy. I shared with you all, and we're going to talk about this too, you had two handouts about the places it's like, oh, the places you'll go and the things you'll do, the places you can observe and the things you can observe. Use that as a template. Of course, you can change it. It's in a Word document. You can change it to, to make it fit your exact um, learning environment or district or program. But that's just to give us an idea of when we're thinking about all of those uh, domains, the variety of places and ways we can do that. And that does not have to be um, face to face. It can certainly be, you, all, you almost literally have your little um, clipboard. You can have a, a small like index spiral notebook that you can pull out, make a quick note. You, you always want to make sure you put the date and the child's name. You make a quick note. What did you see? What did you hear? What did you observe? What did you think you would see that you didn't? And then that way you can go back to it when you want to make sense of all, all of it and surmise it. Some of you mentioned earlier, there are lots of ways to collect and document data. And really when you're observing, you're collecting data. That's all it is. The observation allows you to collect data on children qualitative data and quantitative data are just as valuable. So that qualitative, that's that anecdotal note, right? That you put, it can even be posters. Look, got it right here in my little office space, little post-its you could put on a clipboard and just say, um, 
you know, today I'm going to be focusing on these five students and you put their name and the date across the post-it note and you put it on your clipboard. And then as they are going about their naturalistic opportunities of learning, you know what you're looking for. You're very specific. You see it, you jot it down. That's your anecdotal note. Those work samples are those things um, that you see the child do. And, and then you, you can even say, this is not like it's a secret. We don't want them to know. And if for those of us who you know, were in the classroom, I can remember being in classrooms and, and the children figure stuff out. They will come and get you and tell, you wanna take a picture of this? <laughs> like they just built something with the blocks. It's okay that they know that. We want, we want them to be natural and we want them to be a part of it. And if they're proud of their work, that's a nice sample to collect. It certainly shows growth over time. And, and we know that for early childhood education and care, whether you're using my teaching strategies, early learning scale, um, core work sampling systems, DRDP, there's usually a fall, there's an interim, and then there's a spring, or like, is it fall, winter, spring? So those work samples are so nice because it really does show progress over time, right? And then that's also the importance of why we, we date because ultimately we are, we are comparing not children against children, but their work, right? It's, a lot of times golfers will say, you know, golf does seem like a singular sport and they say, I, I am my own competition. So when you date the work, whether it's the photo, the anecdotal note, the work sample, the video, it really allows you to go back over time and not only see the children's progress, but then see the constant answer to your question. I know I'm teaching. Look at that. They're learning. And, and that's such a wonderful feeling to be able to have. So then if a good piece of evidence, right, can be used multiple ways and sometimes for multiple children, what is a good piece of evidence? It's descriptive. It's authentic snapshot of the behavior, the knowledge or the skill. It provides detail, not labels. You're trying to capture that student in their moment of, of learning even if it's independent. And actually we, we love that because what can they do when they're away from us? That's, that's why we have such that emphasis on choice time with children, right? That 60 minutes, you know, according to the time length of your program of that choice time, because that's when they are away from us. And then we can hear, what are they saying in the block area? What are they saying in dramatic play area? When they're counting in the, in the manipulative area, are they counting up to four, but they have six items there? So we wanna capture and it's collected over time and in different settings. And again, you see, I said it right there, I put that in that highlight, go back to those handouts. They are just templates. They are samples. You can change those and make them fit your needs or use them as they are. You can also take those handouts and put each child that is in your care, put their name on each of those. And then that way, you know for sure you're, you've caught John Doe in all of these interest areas and you've seen all of these uh, benchmarks or goals or domains, I should say. So you can use those handouts in several ways. So here's the difference between descriptive and interpretive. And a lot of you were saying that I really wanna make sure I don't sugarcoat or throw any spice on anything. What are their specific details? What did you actually observe? Read, hear, or see. Now, this is important because sometimes, especially with children at the beginning of the year, that work sample 
when they come to you and they say, oh, look, I wrote a story. Maybe you, you read during, during morning circle or your morning time or your whole group time with the children, you read a story to them. And, the, and this, this particular child really liked that. And now they want to write their own book. And they come up to you and they want you to read the book. And what you see on that paper looks completely different from what they say. Oh, this is my story about, you know, um, I don't know, the ugly duckling or something like that. The words on the paper don't look anything like that. That is not where you see what did you actually observe or read. That's, that's okay. Because the child is going to tell you what they think they wrote, and you're going to repeat it as they said it. That's not making it up. You're helping them connect what they, what's up here, what's actually on their paper, and then what those words really mean and sound. Over time, you would look to see that more of what they think they wrote looks like the actual words and would be more uh, uh, would make more sense not only to, to yourself and to them as they read. So it is okay when you're talking about that actual observation, it, it's okay to ask them, you know, like, oh, read it to me because that will let you know just, just the support they need from you as they grow. So John Doe had a frown on his face and his brow was furrowed. That's a descriptive. We see John Doe, he's frowning and he's got like this, right? I don't want my, my anecdotal note to say, oh, he's angry. John Doe was angry. I don't want my reactions to be involved. And, and really and truly, how did I feel about what I observed? because all of those things can make me lead to an interpretation that, oh, John Doe is angry. But my question to you in the chat is, briefly describe a reason for a student to have a frown on their face and a furrowed brow. What, what could be the reason for that? It could be that they're angry, but what else could it be? Yes, confused, frustrated, right? They, they might really be in deep thought. Heather, let me just tell you, I have resting frown face. And when I'm really, really thinking about something, I, that it's very, very intense that I've had people say, you know, Dr. Taylor, what's wrong? Nothing. I was just really thinking about something. Right. Yes, Heather. Woohoo. Come on, Bob. Us, us frowner thinkers, right? That statue that, you know, we're those kind of people. I'm not angry at all. So we don't want to jump to the conclusion. We just, we would just write the descriptive. This is what I heard. This is what I saw. Um, even if you, if it was a work sample, say, let's go back to that child that wrote that story and, and, and the words that they give us are very different from what it looks like on the paper. I'm going to write on that piece of paper, the child's name, obviously the date. And I'm going to say, John Doe wrote a story about um, going to the zoo and seeing giraffes. Because when I go back to this, I want to be able to remember what was that story about. And I'm not going to add any more to it at all. That descriptive has to be authentic and it has to be true. Because we don't want false positives or false negatives as we monitor the progress of the learning of our children. Jennifer, I love that one. Maybe I'm just not sure what to do next, right? And so, I, I mean, I heard, you know, as the kids say, Miss Antoinette, or I heard Miss Jennifer say, okay, now um, put, your, put your crayons away and get out your folder or go get your book bag. And, and I, I got that first part, put the crayons away, but I was so busy thinking about the first step that I was asked to do. I'm not sure what is my next thing to do. All of those could be reasons that could cause 
the, the, the face of the child to change, but doesn't mean the child is angry at all. And I know that that's different from what we would see in an observe, uh, if we were observing, but I really just want to put that out there so that we can really get, get in our minds. When I see, hear, read, experience, I wanna stay as close to, this is exactly what I saw. This is exactly what I heard. I don't wanna make an interpretation about the child at all. Thank you all. Thank you so much for sharing. Love those ideas. Make sure that I... And, and then two, I, I do wanna um, say this. We're talking about observing, but if I were in a moment of observing and I did happen to see a child, that kind of had that worried look on their face. It's okay for me in that moment to do a check-in because maybe they are frustrated. Maybe they don't under, understand something. And particularly if I know that this is a child whose frustration uh, tolerance level is very low it would certainly be okay for me to stop in my moment of observing, you know, I've got all these things I know I want to observe during this time from, you know, nine o'clock to nine 30 or whenever your time would be that you kind of set apart to specifically do that, to do the check-in with that child. And, and um, yeah, I just think it's important to say that we never want to just see a child that's, that's kind of looking like they might be in duress or discomfort and not do a check-in. I'm just like, that's just your commercial break, just throwing that in. Functional outcomes. This is really the heart of observation. Why I like this definition and why I use it is because it is in direct correlation with the Illinois Early Learning and Development Standards, the new Illinois Learning Standards, and the Illinois Early Learning Guidelines. It is what children know and are able to do. That is a functional outcome. We can look at children. And we've even said, I know that you know such and such. This is, it's this everyone. They have to go hand in hand, right? What do they know and what are they able to do with that behavior, that knowledge, that skill? If they know, but they can't do, the link is broken. We don't have that transferring and generalization of knowledge of behavior or skill. The standards that we use now specifically say, what do they know and what are they able to do? That's a functional outcome. So we're not just looking at the mastery, but what's the appropriate application of what they know. That's like, you know, I know how to swing a golf club, but if you, no, I'm going I'm to use this example. Say I need to put a nail in the wall. I've got a shoe and I'm nailing the, putting the nail in the wall with the shoe. That's not, that's not appropriate. I need to have the right tool to do the right thing. That's mastery and appropriate application. Where are those outcomes that we're looking at? The domains of our children's development. The functionality is that integration. That gets us all the way back to that smarter, not harder, where you could look at a child doing one thing and then seeing several areas of, dom of development domains in action. So the domains are the, are the development, social, emotional, fine motor, gross motor, cognitive, language. The functionality is when we don't see children doing things in isolation. 
we see them beginning to act out the, the true integration of the, the synthesized growth as a whole child. Going to take a minute. We're not going to go deep into the standards, but just want to talk about them a little bit. And for all of my toddler folks on here, um, I do not have the Illinois Early Learning Guidelines, but that's why I spent the time to, to talk about it. The Illinois Early Learning Guidelines is birth to age 36 months. The IELDS starts for children ages three to kindergarten enrollment age. And if you go on the ISBE website, and I do have the link for the IELDS on here, it literally says on that front page, children ages three to kindergarten enrollment age. So when you are teaching through the lens of those IELDS, you are literally preparing children. And remember, what does this standard say? At the end of their time, it's what children will know and be able to do at the end of early childhood education and care, at the end of kindergarten, at the end of first grade, those guidelines, the Illinois Early Learning Guidelines, what, what, what do we want children to be able to do at the end of 36 months? And as many of you have said, they can be with you up until three and a half years old. So that, that overlapping of 36 month old and three year old, that's important to think about. And of course, if you are in a publicly funded kindergarten, you're using the new Illinois learning standards, the Head Start framework, let me just say, and I'm gonna put this out there, Head Start was in front of all of us when it came to the Common Core standards because Head Start has that federal framework that they have to use and the National Head Start Association, they were actually the first ones to correlate and crosswalk the Common Core standards to the Head Start framework. So whether it is Head Start, whether it is a publicly funded kindergarten program, whether you are a private and then part of your day is funded by PFA, everyone is using some type of standard or referring to them. These are what the goals look like. It's that overview and the general statement about the learning in each specific domain, very, very broad. The standard takes that broad goal and then begins to break it down to where it's, it's more manageable. And then that benchmark breaks it down even more to not only where it's manageable, but it's understandable. So if I say a child can follow a one-step direction, that's, what the, that's a benchmark. And we'd have a hard time arguing, what do you mean by one? One literally means one thing. So it's easier to teach, it's easier to understand. Why I'm bringing the standards back up again tonight is because of this, everyone, what you see in front of you. We have to think about intent. The intent is what you're going to teach. The intent of the classroom staff informs everything. So the goal, the standard, the benchmark, that's my intent. You literally could say, I intend for my students to be able to. The descriptor tells us what's the observable activity of the children. And I'm going to literally show you how much I use the standards. Watch this. Oop, I'm back. I keep this. Even as a consultant, I keep, and, and this is a hot commodity. I don't even know if these are, when the standards are first coming out, I keep this with me. I consult around it, whether I'm consulting with districts, with administrators, with, with district superintendents. Legislators, because, well, what's the intent of that legislation? Is it going to help students speak using conventions of standard English? What's the intent? The descriptor 
And this is in for kindergarten, Illinois Early Learning Guidelines and IELDS. And I do have the link and I will put the link in for, um, or Karen, if you can put in the link for the Illinois Early Learning Guidelines so everyone could capture that, that would be great. There's always a descriptor. The descriptor literally says, and I'm just gonna read this one. Um, the standard is speaking using conventions of standard English. Very, very broad. The benchmark says with teacher assistance, use complete sentences and speaking with peers. So what's the first thing that tells me with teacher assistance? My intent is that with my support, this particular child is going to be able to do what? Use complete sentences. It starts with your, your the spectrum of the benchmarks go down in such a way where that first one says with teacher assistant, the last benchmark says they don't even need me. But then when I look at the descriptors, it's literally telling me what might I see? What might I hear? What might I observe? This goes back to that smarter, not harder. We don't have to guess, we can get some clues. And so that's why when we're talking about those functional outcomes, we do not stray away from the standards because the standards is where we get our intent and what you teach is what you wanna see as they learn. What are we teaching? We're implementing our curriculum through the standards, whether whatever curriculum you're using, you're implementing it through the standards. Then what you've taught how you've implemented, then that informs your observation, all the things we just talked about. And then that goes into what? Assessment, planning, materials, activities, all of that. Because I'm okay assessing the children because I know what my intent is. Therefore, I know what I have been teaching. So it's okay for me to pause and assess. I've observed, I've collected my data. How does this inform my planning? Lesson planning. What materials do I need? What, what materials might I take away? What are gonna be the activities? All of those things come from when I observe children. Thanks, and it is in there, everyone. Yes, and Kim, it really is a valuable resource. Um, I, I would certainly encourage you all to jump on the link and we'll actually create a resource page to you all so that when um, Karen does the follow-up um, uh, with the link for the evaluation, we'll share it with you. Uh, like I said, these flip books, they, when the, and this goes back to 2013 when the standards were first being you know revised from the Illinois Learning Centers to IELDS. I mean, my name is all, it's such a hot commodity. If you don't have the flip book, make the standards a favorite on your laptop. There's also um, most, uh, my teaching strategies, early learning scale has done it. Um, I believe core, if you use high scope, they have correlated everything that is uh, within their assessment to our standards, again, making it easier. So when you know when you're trying to do those collection periods and you're actually going in the system to put in your notes, you're able to see, oh, this, this benchmark correlates to this part of this assessment tool that I use. Most of them have done that. And if they have not, um, certainly if you're an administrator, ask them to because they should. In order, the State Board of Education does not um, endorse one platform over another, but they make it very, very clear in order to do business in Illinois, their platform, their curriculum, their assessment, it has to be authentic, it has to be evidence-based, and it has to crosswalk with our standards. So we observed to inventory interest. We talked about this a little bit. What do they like? Like, what do they like? What don't they like? Yeah, but they're just children. They're humans. And sometimes 
behavior management and classroom management is literally the kids trying to tell us, we do not like this. Yeah, but I have to do the standards. Yes, you do. But what are their interests? What are ways that I can stay true to these standards, stay true to developmentally appropriate practice, and still get that inroad of letting the students know I am interested in your thoughts? Then even if you have to explain, okay, but today for right now, we're going to do what Miss Ant do this Miss Antoinette's way. And then when you have your choice time, you can do the do this. Knowing what children like, dislike, and their interests is very important. How to observe, know the purpose. You're on the outside looking in. Really try to be focused. Silence is golden. Have that eat ways to document and plan, plan, plan. When you think of your lesson plans, don't just think of the lesson that you're going to implement. The written word is very powerful, everyone. If you actually, in your lesson plan, make your notes for what you're going to observe, the children you're going to be focusing on, um, the benchmarks, whatever it is, if you put that in your lesson plan, the likelihood that you will uh, carry it out, it elevates because it was important enough to write down. So plan, just like with real estate, location, 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 plan, 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 all of it, observing, plan all of it. We talked about this, know what you see, don't see what you know. You come up to a conclusion because it fits you. We don't want to infer, we don't want to interject, we don't want to interfere. Now that we've talked about observation, we're gonna kind of finish up our evening to talk about the purpose of assessment. When you are observing, you're really preparing yourself to be able to sit down, look at what you've collected, and then you're making an assessment of the student's learning. Have my students learn what I taught? That same data that you collected for observation, you are assessing what are the students ready to learn? If they have learned what you taught, then what are they ready to learn next? If they haven't learned what you've taught, I need to go back and figure out what do I need to do? I, I'm ready to move on. The book says I should move on. You know, my even lesson plan, if we've mapped our curriculum, curriculum mapping says I should move on, but my students do not have a grasp of this. Is it the whole class? Is it a small group? Is it one or two children? Assessment lets us know how are they ready to learn it? So when you observe to understand their interests, then I can make that assessment to say, and this is how they are ready to learn this. And then I assess to understand when. When is the best time to introduce a new concept? When is the best time to press pause and polish so that they get to that, as the descriptor says, building. We start out with exploring new content. Then they're kind of emerging, developing. Then at that building, they're ready to move on. This is not the purpose of assessment. And when you all were in the chat and you were saying it's scary sometimes and why do administrators, this picture, I love this picture. I searched and searched and searched to find this picture. Because quite unfortunately, assessment has boiled down to this. Somebody from the state board is looking at the, is, or, or the districts, right? The district board or the state board is looking, at the, is looking at the principal. And so the principal is looking at the teacher and the teacher is looking at the child. All trying, all under the guise of the joy of learning. 
This makes assessment scary. This takes that accountability phrase and changes it into something completely different than what we talked about tonight. And it is not at all. Oh, thanks, Karen. I see you put that in there. Thank you. This is not at all the purpose of assessment, really at any grade level. Certainly not at early childhood education and care. The pressure, and, and, and if we were honest, and we're going to be tonight, we could say this starts from the Department of Ed to the State Education Agency, which for us is the State Board of Education, to the superintendents of the districts. From there, no, let's go back to the boards, to the superintendents, to the building leaders, to the teachers, to the children, and then the families. So we want to look at assessment and I'm just actually gonna go back to, this is really the purpose of assessment. Thank you, Kim. Thank you so much for putting that in. And this is just for my teaching strategies. Uh, I will say to you um, again, most DRDP, they have aligned what they're doing to the standards. Thanks, Karen. And so as you look at this picture, How does that picture resonate with you when it comes to your, regarding your own experience in education? So thinking of this, in the chat, briefly share how that resonates with you. There's this song, I can't even remember who sings it. Um, it there's like a, a hook that goes under pressure. Doom, 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 doom. That is too much pressure. Assessment is not meant to do that at all. Thank you, Beth. Oh, that's why that's on my mind. I saw a special about him this weekend. It's not meant to put us in that pressure cook pressure cooker situation. And to be honest, that's why it makes it difficult and scary to engage with data because we're used to data being used to do this to us rather than to highlight. Yes, absolutely, Heather, thank you for sharing. And, and, and what, what makes it worse is because of that blame and shame um, kind of energy that's out there, it's all, it's like, well, the super, the board says the superintendent isn't doing what they're supposed to be doing. Then the superintendent says the principal's not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Then the principal says the teacher's not doing what they're supposed to be doing. Sometimes the teachers then say, well, the families, the families, they're, they're hard to reach. They're not cooperating. It's like, Finger, 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 finger. And while we're doing this, we're not doing this. Coming together to work. Remember that strengthening cross-sector partnerships, that third theme of the Kindergarten Transition Advisory Committee report? We're not doing that. So I love that picture and I use it often, especially when I'm trying to speak with legislators. Like, hey, we have to get off the backs of people. Here are different types of assessment. And again, state, district, federal, agency, those assessments that um, we don't have the, as the power, it's okay for those assessments to exist, but they need to be balanced with this, that periodic assessment used to determine what students know and do not know at a particular point in time. This is my favorite one, interim. I'm doing that check-in, grasp of content, 
guide future instruction. How can I adjust? Summative is usually very, very standardized. Interim and formative, that's where we are empowered to observe the data, make the assessment, and then what do our children need more from us? What support do they need from us? Do we have high flyers in our classroom who we could challenge a little bit more? Do we have students who need some, some building up? And, and more importantly, those average kids, hey, I'm three, I look like I'm three, I act like I'm three, where's Dora the Explorer? We don't wanna lose those children either. It's our average middle of the road one sometimes that can kind of get lost because your high flyers, they're, I mean, they're, they're almost telling you. The children who, who you know are struggling, uh, they pull on you, they tug on your heart. So you're really giving them, you know, that extra bit of support. But it's that child that's like, they're just kind of right there where they're supposed to be in that moment of time. We always want to see what do the children need from us? What is the attention that they need? So for us, that interim and that formative, this is where our empowerment is. And remembering in Illinois, all children from EC to kindergarten. And I'm only talking about screening as we come to a close because we started out talking about the KTAC report. And the KTAC report reminds us and the pre-2K project um, that Cindy Berry has been really um, I, I don't wanna say it's an initiative because it's not a state initiative, but the Pre-2K project really is, it is her effort to work closely with um, kindergarten individual development survey team, team to say, this is something that can be brought to life. When we do that, we find commonalities. In Illinois, all children entering kindergarten are screened slash surveyed to determine their readiness to get a baseline to inform instructional strategies and techniques. And all children entering early childhood education and care, whether it's Head Start, if it's preschool for all, preschool for all expansion, are screened. Not just so we can weigh eligibility or we can check it off our compliance checklist because it is literally the window to the soul of the child. We don't know these children. When we screen them, that gives us a bit of information about what, they, what their immediate and initial needs will be from us. How do we do these things? We try to do them as authentically as possible for the children. So we have screeners, we observe, we assess, and in Illinois, all of this is connected early childhood to kindergarten. It's all based on the standards. Here's what, there's several screeners for students that are in early childhood education and care. In Illinois, if they are in kindergarten, there is one, the kids, and, and for our private school folks, I'm very happy to say um, that the archdiocese um, across the state, several of them have been reaching out, understanding that, hey, it makes so much sense because not all of our children are entering kindergarten having had an early childhood education and care experience. We know that to be true. So how can we not have to guess? Well, I guess they're ready to learn. We can have a a survey. It's not an assessment. It's not an evaluation. It's literally our screening and, and their survey. Look how it's aligned with the, the domains of development. This is what it looks like. And we do have a link for kids, for those of you that, if you're interested in learning a little bit more, mostly the focus is on the standards. Illinois Early Learning and Development Standards, the kids measures, 
And then you can always put in the kindergarten standards as well. So as we close, I'd love for you to just jump in the chat and just share what has resonated with you the most today. Or um, let's, we can even stop sharing and you can come off mute if anyone is brave enough as we have rounding up our time, just come off mute and share what kind of resonated with you the most. And there are so many on, I just thank you all. This is just such a lovely, lovely, nice group. I see so many familiar names. I think I gave you your shout out, Miss Denise. So if anybody would like to share what their aha moment or anything that resonated with them from our time together tonight. I guess my aha moment is to look at assessment, clinical observation, and the way we document and the way we look at children. Um, we always need to remember administration and those up above but we also need to remember why we're in that classroom mm -hmm. and it's to provide quality um, experiences and teaching opportunities to the children that we are working with so that they can um, reach their maximum potential in all areas, all content areas um, and social and emotionally. Um, and I think that when we're less, um, less worried, I, I'm not saying that we need to not worry, but I think when we keep that in the back of our minds rather than in the front of our frontal lobe, that we will be more relaxed. We will do what we have to do and we will do it with ease Therefore, the children will see it and development just, ha it just happens. It flourishes. Children that will learn. That was so well said. It's almost like, woohoo, you are officially my co-presenter, <laughs> Rosemary, because that was so wonderfully said. Yeah. This is curriculum, instruction, assessment. It's all a part of teaching and learning. It's all a part of the teaching and energy is transferable. So what we transfer, our energy is transferable to children. It informs how we're trying to think of families um, and hopefully it can help our families um, take comfort in, in their children's progress as well. I see Denise, Kim, Kim was saying it was nice to review the purposes of assessment and observing. Um, yeah, it's nice to review, like, why are we even doing all this in the first place? I, I've seen that in the chat. Um, I said I was going to give you some time back. So in order for me not to be a complete <laughs> dishonest person, it's 527, so I'm finished. You're in, the, <laughs> you're in the hands of Karen.